Good morning. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's great. Now, when I was in my meeting yesterday, uh, our chief of staff for the regional conservation was reminding me about the black church. When the pastor gets up, Mr. Tillman, he says that I'm not going to hold you long. And about two hours into that, you're thinking, wait a minute now, you said you're not going to hold me long. So I'm not going to hold you long because I know I'm standing between you and the break and Mr. Will Primos. So we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Hey, thank you just for the welcome for our secretary yesterday. Thank you for being an attentive audience. And he really enjoyed himself here. So thank you for that. Also, let's welcome my colleagues from NRCS from around the country. Could you all stand up, please? Thank you for that. And you know, I gave them the option of being here or staying home for Valentine's Day. Guess where they are? They're here. So, folks, uh, for the next few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about some really important things. And I want to start off with, and I have a clicker here. I've got to make sure I can do this right. We're going to talk a little bit about the history and kind of how this whole thing started and why we do what we do. It's going to be real important as we talk through this next few minutes. When we talk about locally led and we talk about Hugh Hammond Bennett and what happened in the 1930s, the early 1930s, the call, you can call it the call to arms. And the secretary talked yesterday about what happened then and why we, where we are with this climate challenge right now, it could be almost the same thing. But let's think back to 1930 when that Dust Bowl happened and Hugh Hammond Bennett was standing in Washington, D.C. and he's waiting for this storm to get there and people were getting pretty restless. He said, no, and I could hear him, I could probably hear him say, just wait, it's coming. And it showed up. And look at where we are today. This is a picture of our founder and our first chief in 1940 in a field in Idaho, Curtis. And he was talking about soil health at that time. We've been doing this for almost 90 years. Now, we might be calling this something else today, but this is what we've been doing. And from that very inception, when we start talking about locally led and the local process, let's think about what that means. That means that you all have an important job at that local level. Now, one of the things that is statutory, it's there, it talks about the local led process and all these programs that we administer. I am hopeful that every one of you are part of your local work group. You have to be in the conversation to talk about what those local resource issues are. What are your local concerns? And from those local work groups, that information should be going up to the State Technical Committee, which a lot of you, are hopefully you're on, or have a voice. And those folks are talking to those state conservationists out there about resource needs and resource challenges at the local level and at the state level. And all of course, we're probably gonna send some things down from the administration that are important. So how does that state conservation take all that information, boil it down, and come up with that system for that state? We give them a lot of latitude in making those decisions. I hope you're engaged in this local process and how that all works. Secondly, we're a science-based agency. And I hear a hand clap over here. We're a science-based agency. That's real important. Because we don't just go out and just randomly do, I heard, used to hear Dave White talk about random acts of conservation. We don't do that. We do things in a science-based approach. And how do we do that? We do that through conservation planning. That is an important part of what we were built on that's an important part of our mission, 
and that's going to continue to be an important part. We need planners out there that are out there working with landowners. We've been hearing that 70% of this land is in private ownership, and we're those trusted partners that go out and work with these landowners to talk about these conservation needs. I can remember back 43 years ago when I was an intern in SOLCON, my job was to go out and get and do 102s, 104s, 106s, and 108s. I know that don't mean a lot to a lot of y'all. But those were my goals. I had to go out and meet with landowners. We walked every acre. We talked about what those resource concerns were. And we made recommendations. And you know what? Sometime that landowner already had the solution if we were listening as they talk to us. We developed that conservation plan, and at that time, we didn't have all these federal dollars. These folks did a lot of this conservation work out of their own pockets. If we provide that conservation technical assistance, most of this will happen. And one of the other things we have to do is give farmers credit for the work they're already doing when we show up. That's gonna be really important as we move forward. Here in this slide, Vermont, the Orleans Conservation District. Are, are y'all here today? <laughs> Travis is here, our state conservationist. Thank you, Travis. And they're helping us with edge of field monitoring. This is really important. Folks, as we move into this next phase, We've been talking about MMRV, the measurement, the monitoring, the reporting, the verifications. That's going to be important. Let's think about this. When you're sitting around your dinner table at 6.30 at night and this commercial comes on about agriculture, how do we explain the investment that the public is making when we talk about all these investments? How do we explain that? It can't be tons saved. It can't be parts per million. How do you explain that to the voting population that we need this investment? That's going to be critical as we move forward. Voluntary. The secretary talked about that yesterday. This is how we get work done. We're not regulatory. If we were regulatory, I wouldn't be here. And I know a lot of you wouldn't be in this room. It's voluntary conservation. How do we go out and convince that landowner that these methods, these practices, these things we do are important? How do we do that? That's why you're all here. Because a lot of you do this on a voluntary basis as board members. You don't get paid a dime for what you do. Or you might get a little mileage. And if you're Bob First, who I know is here from Ohio, he puts on like 20, 30,000 miles a year when he was president. And you can, you can show up anywhere in the state of Ohio and Bob First was there, especially if there was a restaurant. <laughs> Bob, sorry to pick on you. But you folks do a lot of great work. And we're going to need that to continue. And when you look at this slide, I had an opportunity to be in New York City with our state conservationist, Blake Gover, and look at some of the urban work that was happening. Phenomenal. People want to grow local. They want to buy local. They want that nutritional value when they pick that fruit or vegetable. They want to keep it there. Great things happen in the state of New York. I was in the state of Georgia, and where's my Korean family? Are you in here? The Korean Association? Their, their association from Georgia. And I will tell you, those folks are doing some amazing work on conservation in the state of Georgia. It was great to be there to see some of that work going on. In our tribal nations and some of the things that are happening there, you know, we have a responsibility there. We have a trust responsibility. And we've been doing a lot of work with our tribal nations on consultations and the great work that happens around this country. We have to make sure we're inclusive of all the folks. Now, there are five priorities that we set for the agency when I came in. Number one, equity. Two, climate change. Three, urban agriculture. Four, workforce. Five, partnerships. They're all important. 
and we're going to need all of you helping us to achieve this. And lastly, I want to talk about partnerships. Um, I'm going to give you some time back because between the secretary and the panel here this morning, they, we've covered a lot of these things. But I want to tell you how important this partnership is and why we have to stick together. Right now, uh, our agency, we have about 10,000 employees, 10,006. We can't do this by ourselves. From its inception, we talk about the partnership and how this was formed. You know, NRCS came out of districts. I want you to listen to me real careful here because I taught this class. We have a class called Conservation for New Employees. And my part was to teach the course on how this started. In the 1930s, our agency was called the Soul Erosion Service. That's how we started. And when Hugh Hammond Bennett started talking about all this, he talked about the local process, those local needs, those local conditions, and how do we solve that. That's why districts were formed. And after that, we talked about the federal presence that it needed. NRCS came out of that movement as this oil erosion service in the early 30s. And we've had several names change. I know Chief Knight is in the room. We went from the Soil Conservation Service over to the Natural Resources Conservation Service because we are our agency that talks about all resources. And throughout that movement, we've had a pretty rich history of working in partnerships with all of you. And when you talk about the investments that we have, we started with the Dust Bowl in the 30s. We have climate now. How do we get this done? You, talk, we, you heard about the investment in BIL, almost a billion dollars that came to NRCS. We made a commitment to the underserved communities that we would take some of those dollars and make sure that we did some great things. I was in the state of Arkansas, Mike Sullivan, wherever you are here, thank you. In the state of Mississippi, Kirk Reedus. Folks, let me tell you, I'm from an area in Mississippi that don't a lot of things happen. And, and I'm from a family that struggled to make ends meet because we were farming. Dad, a cotton farmer. Had an old farmer all tractor, which I still have. Should have put the pitch up. I'm still driving it, still brush hogging. It's a little dangerous because it's one of those bicycle, you know, bicycle, the tricycle types. But I was able to buy a new tractor last year for the first time. That's cool, right? I got a new tractor? Yeah. <laughs> but just watching how I didn't understand all of it when I was a child at home, how this whole thing worked. I would go into the office with my dad at USDA, and we would sit there for hours just waiting. It was kind of like going to the doctor. At that time, we had to go to the health department, and we went in, we went in the side that said color folks. Now, this is during my lifetime. My kids don't understand this when I talk about it. Dad, that happened 200 years ago. No way. But as they grow, they're, they're, they're learning. And we'd sit there, and we'd wait, and we'd wait. My dad couldn't read or write. That's why I was there. And we'd get handed all of these forms, or we did not because we're out of money. Come back. We'll let you know when we get more. And when we did sign something, my dad would put his X on it. But over a period of a little while, we taught, we taught my dad how to sign his name and we taught him to read, me and my sisters and brothers. I'm saying that to say this. We have a lot of folks out there that want to be part of this conservation family. And we have to open our doors and be open-minded enough, as the general talked about yesterday. What did he tell us? Our audio has to be the same as our video. You remember saying that? We can't say one thing and we do something else. I really, we really need your help. As you go back to those local areas out there, please be inclusive of all the people that want to be part of this family. 
it would help you immensely. Because when you look at NRCS, my commitment when I came in to this agency was, we're gonna look like the rest of America. Let me tell you something. This is the best group of people that I've ever seen, and I've been doing this for a long time. You look around the table, they bring in differences. They bring in uniqueness. They bring in new ideas from, from young to old, the diversity that we have among them. And I'm gonna tell you right now, sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable in that room when they start talking because they're bringing up all these things that we need to consider. Have, we, have you considered this? Have you considered that? What about this? It makes us better as an agency when we have those discussions, when you have the right folks around the table. And when I say the right folks, it's a diverse group of folks. And I don't wanna be preachy here. I'm not gonna hold you long. Come on now, come on now. I'm not gonna hold you long. But we are gonna, I know together we're gonna make this commitment. When we talk about BIL, when we talk about the investments in IRA, once in a lifetime opportunity here to make a difference. When we look at partnerships for climate smart commodities, once in a lifetime to make a difference. We're gonna implement all of these programs. We need your help. Another thing we're gonna need your help with is, is that, as I mentioned, we don't have enough boots on the ground with the federal family, so it's gonna take a fall. We started out with the districts. Where are we now? Look at all the partnerships in this room right now and the folks that are gonna help us get this work completed. It's not, sometimes it's not about the money. It's about the collaboration and working together to get this accomplished. And I know that we're gonna do this. Uh, in the room yesterday, I've, I've got a new middle name. Secretary, uh, we was in a meeting, he brought this up. I shouldn't, should not have reminded him of it yesterday, but my new middle name is Delivery. And I meeting yesterday, he called me Chief Delivery. Help me deliver on that promise that we can do this work. We can get this done. We can get this done. The biggest investments in conservation, the biggest investment in conservation, we can get this done. And I'll close with this. When you go home, please walk into that office and say thank you to that district administrator. Thank you to that district technician. Thank you to that education specialist. Thank you to that soil conservationist, that soil conservation technician. Thank you to that district conservationist. Thank you to that area conservationist. Those are the folks that are accomplishing this work. And with all of us working together, we can create a clear path for them to get this work completed. Folks, we need you. We need you engaged. And thank you for your warm reception for me and my team. We are partners with you. We're gonna engage with you. Again, we can, we can deliver to this American public a great conservation movement. The needs, when we talk about soil erosion, we talk about soil health, we talk about water quality, anything they're talking about, we can deliver that. So thank you for the opportunity to be here, and Michael Crowley is gonna join me on stage right now.